Good evening, Americans, and welcome to The Ed Show, live from Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. Let's get to work. First of all, global warming is not taking place. It's kind of laughable right now with all of the records that are being sent. 2014 will go down as the warmest year around the globe in recorded history. I do not believe that human activity is causing these dramatic changes to our climate the way these scientists are portraying it. These uh, carbon emission regulations are creating havoc in my state and other states. Calling CO2 a pollutant uh, is doing a disservice to the country. I think it's doing a disservice to the world. There is not agreement around the fact of exactly what is causing this. This year's record fueled by the warming oceans with seven consecutive months of new high temperatures. In the last 15 years, there has been no recorded warming. Hot temperatures, low humidity, and strong winds are fueling a growing wildfire. We have people with their lives tied up in, 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 in trying to make this hoax a reality. Good to have you with us tonight, folks. Thanks for watching. Well, let's start out 2015 with a declaration here that I'm not a scientist, and you probably aren't either. But you know what? You don't have to be a scientist to figure this out. We start this year with a very important issue heading into 2015, climate change. And we are just days away from Republicans calling all of the shots on Capitol Hill. Their agenda, real basic, Keystone, corporate tax cuts, Another bad trade deal in the TPP, and let's deregulate Wall Street. That's what they're all about. Nothing's changed. Americans who care about climate change, well, you're going to have to take a rain check, because I am convinced that there will be no legislative effort to address the problem facing our globe. 2014 is set to be the warmest year globally in history. The final numbers for December haven't been officially released by NOAA. The first 11 months, though, of 2014 were the warmest on record. Last year, we saw seven straight months of record high ocean temperatures from the month of May to November. Now, are, are we to believe that, you know, ah, this is just kind of freaky, it's really no big deal. You know, that's the case that climate deniers in Washington are going to make, and they're going to pay no attention to the problem for the next two years. Elections have consequences. What we're going to hear, most likely, is a lot of stuff like this in 2015. I live in Wisconsin. You know, th there were, two, I think, 200-foot-thick glaciers in Wisconsin. W w how do you explain that the it's climate a, change it's a, before, it's before a, man ever had a carbon footprint? How, how do you explain that climate The statement that, that you just made is blatantly false. What we have to look at is the fact that you don't make good laws, sustainable laws, when you're making them on hypotheses or theories or unproven sciences. First of all, global warming is not taking place. It's kind of laughable right now with all of the records that are being sent, being set. I do not believe that human activity is causing these dramatic changes to our climate the way these scientists are portraying it. The problem with climate change is there's never been a day in the history of the world in which the climate is not changing. So you don't believe that there is any man-made uh, reason for global, global warming or climate change? What I think is, is the data are not supporting what the advocates are arguing. The last 15 years, there has been no recorded warming. And these are the folks who are in charge now. Science-denying Republicans, they're dead wrong. It's no coincidence, three of the warmest years on record have happened in the past decade, 2005, 2010, and most likely 2014. It's not just warming temperatures. America is witnessing firsthand the devastating effects of climate change. This year, the state of California had its worst drought in over, here's the number, in over 1,200 years. Even the recent rainfall, the state needs 11 trillion gallons of water to recover. Now, over the summer, we saw a water ban for 400,000 people in Toledo, Ohio. Warmer temperatures and phosphorus runoff from farms caused algae blooms in Lake Erie. The algae contaminated the city's water supply with dangerous bacteria. This summer also brought record wildfires to the western, western portion of the United States. Washington State, for example, experienced its largest wildfire in state's history. Roughly 400 square miles of land burned with 300 structures lost. The list of climate change-related events in 2014, it's long and it's disturbing.
Unfortunately, last year also brought disasters in the form of oil spills. Back in March, 168,000 gallons of fuel oil spilled in the Galveston Bay, Texas, after an oil barge collided with another ship. The spill affected wildlife and hurt the local economy, which revolves around fishing. Now, we saw this absurd scene in Los Angeles, California. Remember this? A 20-inch wide pipeline ruptured, sending crude oil high into the air. Over 10,000 gallons of crude turned the streets of L.A. into a river of oil. Let's not forget Louisiana. State of Louisiana saw one of the largest pipeline spills this year. In October, the Mid-Valley Pipeline ruptured near Morning Sport, Louisiana. Over 4,000 barrels of crude were spilled. Some of the oil entered a creek that feeds Cato Lake near Shreveport, Louisiana. Meanwhile, almost five years later, Louisiana is still suffering from the 2010 BP oil spill. They'll tell you everything's good. Not true. The state just reopened closed fishing grounds near Grand Isle on December 10th. Seems like all good news, right? But if you talk to the local fishermen, that's just not the case. I was looking at my figures before I came here. For the first 18 days of the month, before BP in 2009, we did uh, 2,666,000 pounds, and this year we did 129,000. We're down to about 4%. And, uh, it's a tough situation. It's hard to just imagine getting 4% of your check and see how good you'd be doing. None of the 2014 events will phase Republicans. They are going to come forward and say, well, we need more oil, got to have more coal, and, of course, we need less and much fewer EPA regulations. You know the drill. Nothing's going to change. So what can we expect from the weather in 2015? And if we have disasters, will a Republican Congress, with all the power, will they spend the money to restore lives and damage? Or are we going to get more Storm Sandy treatment from this outfit? Big questions. But what I fear is the next couple of years, they will not address climate change and the, denier, and the deniers will prevail. Get your cell phones out. I want to know what you think. Tonight's question, will Republicans do anything to help combat climate change? Text A for yes, text B for no to 67622. You can leave a comment on our blog at ed.msnbc.com. We'll bring you the results later on in the show. We start this Ed show 2015 with climate change because I think it has to be talked about. It is a mammoth story, and it's going to be worse if we do nothing in the next two years. We'll be losing more ground. For more, let me bring in Paul Douglas, who is a senior meteorologist at Meteologic Group in Minneapolis. Also, also with us tonight, Reese Halter, conservation biologist with the Muse School. His upcoming book is Shepherding the Sea, The Race to Save Our Oceans. Gentlemen, great to have you with us tonight. Paul, you first. What are the chances of us having a similar year in 2015 to what we've just had in the last 12 months? Your thoughts. I think there's a good chance, Ed, it's actually going to be warmer next year worldwide. 2014 will be the warmest year on record, according to the climate scientists I know and respect. In terms of the NOAA database, it's a slam dunk. 2014, the warmest worldwide, even though much of the eastern U.S. skewed a little bit cooler. The NASA database, they're saying about a 60 to 70 percent probability that 2014 will be the warmest year. 14 of the last 15 years, the warmest on record. You keep hearing about, well, air temperatures have plateaued. There's some truth to that, but the warmth is going into the oceans. We are conducting an experiment on the world's oceans. And as a meteorologist, I'm seeing the symptoms of a warmer, wetter, more volatile climate. Just like if somebody's running a fever of a couple of degrees, you see the symptoms on that person. They're running a fever. Maybe they have a rash or a blister. They're sneezing. You say two degrees. What's two degrees? Well, two degrees can be a big deal. And we're going to see more of those symptoms during 2015. Uh, more jaw-dropping examples of weather extremes, Ed. That is probably in the pipeline yeah. for this year. Dr. Halter, it all revolves around the oceans and the Great Lakes, what we've seen happen there. What signal is that bringing uh, uh, the world, do you think? Well, Ed, good evening. Happy New Year to you, Paul. Uh, and Ed, what we, what we are really concerned with are these are the facts. 
Cancer is on the rise. Heart disease is the number one disease in the United States, and one in three people are in pain and take pain medications. How does this relate to the oceans? Let me tell you. The coral reefs, the biodiversity hotspots all around our planet, half of them are dead. The strongest pain cancer and heart disease medicines come from these reefs. We are, we are fueling this, we're killing our life support system. This is an SOS, it's a call to action, and it's disgraceful that the public officials are sneering at science. Well, if the oceans continue to get warmer, what is this gonna do to the fishery? What is this going to do to the, the uh, longevity uh, of, of the species that are out there? I mean, how much warmer can the oceans get before it starts to take the toll, take its toll? Well, right now we're, we're seeing the toll. The, the, here are the other facts. Nine out of the ten surface fisheries are in decline. The bottom fisheries are being smashed at 150 times what's happening with clear cutting on the lands. The whales are being poached by Japanese ocean killers. The dolphins are being slaughtered. They're the doctors of the sea. The shark population over the last eight years, 660 million sharks are gone. Nine out of 10 sharks have been poached. It's, it's a free-for-all, and we, we know what's ahead. So now we got to take action worldwide. And by the way, United States is the greatest country in the world, and we have to provide the leadership for China and the other nations to follow, Ed. Yeah. Paul, are you, are you concerned about the politics of all of this? What, and I'll ask both of you. Paul, you first. What if we do nothing? What, what if we do, what if, what if we come back here two years from today and we've done nothing on climate change, we've taken no measures whatsoever? I guess I'm not too confident that the people in power right now are paying much attention to what's happening on the globe. And if you look back at the people in power and then the Republicans, they have said some things about conservation. They've, they've made statements about caring about the planet, but yet I just don't see any action. Paul, your thoughts. Well, Ed, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm also a moderate Republican. I'm a scientist. I'm a meteorologist. I'm a businessman. And I'm going to quote scripture on your show, maybe for the last time. Man has been appointed as a steward for the management of God's property. Ultimately, he will give account for his stewardship. That is Luke 16, 2. How did the Republican Party go from reverence and respect for the environment to let's plunder the planet, let's take our chances, let's treat the earth like a dirty ATM card. The Republican Party has a long, rich tradition of stewardship, starting with Teddy Roosevelt and the park system. George H.W. Bush, of course, the Clean Air Act. President Nixon launched the EPA. And Ronald Reagan, in 1984 said, I'm proud to have been one of the first to recognize that states and the federal government have a duty to protect our natural resources from the damaging effects of pollution that can accompany industrial development. How do we get from there to here? And I tell people who are incredulous, how can people be denying evidence and data? And I say, follow the money. Trillions of dollars of carbon still in the ground People, the richest corporations that have ever been, want to be able to harvest that carbon. That is why we are having this debate about facts, about evidence, about yeah. data. Well put. You can it's quote scripture anytime you want on this show. I mean, I think it's, uh, it parallels everything that we need to pay attention to. Dr. Halter, what if we do nothing the next two years? How far behind are we going to be? Oh, look, it'll be a full-on disaster. You can expect uh, higher highs, lower lows. You can expect more intense uh, tornadoes down Tornado Alley. The droughts will deepen. The wildfires will worsen. And everyone on the street, by the way, will be paying more for the groceries. But, you know, here's that's what could be. But change is opportunity in disguise. 
Entrepreneurs know this. It's time to future-proof America. It's time to do our water systems over, weatherproof our buildings, yep. and spend dollars on Main Street in every community. After all, isn't that what the Republicans are about, the people on the ground, Ed? Well, they you know, say they are. Hey, we'll Ed? find out. They'll have control of the money. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Reese has a, has a perfectly uh, good point. It, it's going to come down to jobs. If we don't come up with market-based solutions by putting a price on carbon, those jobs are going to go to China and possibly Finland and who knows where else. But ultimately, we need to put a price on carbon so that the market can come up with the solutions, the thousands of new businesses that will create responsible energy. We need the energy, that's a given, but there's a way to create that responsibly. And the key is the markets. And, and, and at some and point, Paul, it's going I, to come from the add, ground up. I would add one thing. In 2014, we found, we found the, we, the bullet a supercritical steam from solar thermal energy in Australia is the answer. It's uh, throughout the Southwest, we can light up this nation with innovation. Innovation is our best friend, and that those are millions of long-term, clean, real jobs. There's no problem here. Right. It is time to roll up our sleeves. Dr. Reese Halter, Agreed. Paul Douglas, gentlemen, great to have you with us tonight. It is a very important subject. We're going to spend a lot of time on it in 2015. Are we going to be our brother's keeper? And of course, we're going to have disasters. We're going to have tornadoes and hurricanes and big storms. There will be damage. And what will be the conversation in Washington? More offsets? More digging into retirement, more digging into pension, more digging into Social Security to pay for disasters that are coming because we're paying no attention to climate change. Elections have consequences. Be prepared. We'll do nothing on climate change the next couple of years. The only person that can push it forward at this point is probably the president. Maybe he can motivate the Republicans to pay attention to facts. One final note. We already have our first oil disaster of 2015. On New Year's Eve, eight storage oil tanks near Williston, North Dakota caught fire. The tanks contained roughly 1,000 barrels of oil and officials say that they were being allowed to burn themselves out today. An oil tanker truck was unloading when the fire broke out, but the exact cause of the blaze isn't yet known. Remember to answer tonight's question there at the bottom of the screen. Share your thoughts with us on Twitter at Ed Show and on Facebook. We appreciate the like. We always want to know what you think. Coming up, celebrating the liberal legacy of former New York Governor Mario Cuomo. And later, under the bad trade deal, could be headed for the fast track. Oh, we're off to a good start in the New Year's. We're talking about the threat of the TPP. Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky and Larry Kona, the CWA, joins us. Stay with us. We're right back.